Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Corrine. Um, thanks to the APVMA uh, for inviting me here today, uh, giving us the opportunity to give you guys an update. Um, uh, thanks very much, uh, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself, um, my name's Tim Karlov, as you, as you can see. I've been working in uh, AgVet Chem um, policy uh, in sort of broader, broader area for just over six months. Um, took over from Mark Kelly, who you may uh, know and who may have uh, presented at, uh, at earlier ones of these events. Um, so I'll, I'll run through the work that I do, but also the work that, uh, that we do more generally uh, within the department. Uh, we've also got a couple of other departmental people in the audience, either here, to, here now or will be here later, uh, especially Ro Mueller, who's starting in my team today. So if you're here, Ro, g'day. <laughs> there's there's Ro. Um, and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll endeavour to catch up during breaks or, or what have you. So as, uh, as Karina uh, touched on, just um, start with a little bit of a discussion about reform. Um, given, given the time, I won't sort of go in too much, uh, through the history too much, other than to say that um, I'm aware and, uh, and others in the department uh, are very aware that, that reform's just been an, a, sort of a, an ongoing rolling series of processes. Uh, since at least the A9 um, Plastics and Chemical uh, Regulation Productivity Commission review, um, and that's sort of sort of led to uh, led to tranche of reform after tranche of reform. Um, I won't go I won't go through them through them in detail, but there've been some um, some significant changes um, being designed largely around um, improving efficiency, managing managing risk, um, improving access to chemicals. We do know, and we have heard the, heard the message, that it has been challenging for stakeholders, challenging for the APVMA to keep up with the pace and extent of reform. Um, so we've got, uh, got some that have come through recently, some more that are, that are coming through or have just come through um, around, uh, around more prescribed variations, um, primary, secondary applications, and longer, uh, longer registration renewal periods. Uh, last year, around July, uh, the government released its Agricultural Competitiveness White Paper. It was a sort of its, its white paper, its, its policy plan across the entire agricultural sector. It included uh, guidance uh, or direction on AgVet CHEMS. Um, basically the principles outlined in the white paper were around streamlining regulation, increasing access to, uh, to ag and vet chemicals and improving the effectiveness and efficiency of regulation. The white paper also uh, mentioned a few or touched on a few specific uh, measures, at least at a very high level, and those were uh, reducing pre-market assessments uh, for, for lower risk products, managing uh, matching risk to, uh, to regulatory effort, uh, a recognition of overseas assessments um, and, uh, and exploring with the states um, ways to uh, closer align around control of use um, uh, nationally. So last year, the department undertook a couple of uh, major rounds of consultation, one leading up to the development of the white paper and following its, its release. Uh, and went, uh, went around, the, around the country, uh, held 45 meetings with 150 stakeholders. A lot of that sort of fed into the ideas that went into the white paper and that, that went into subsequent reform proposals. And then a second round, at the end of last year, um, the department put out um, some discussion papers uh, around reform, did, a, did another, uh, another bit of a national tour um, consulted 160 odd people, um, and uh, the, the, the discussion papers were on sort of a range of a range of matters, and I've, I've listed some of them there again: international uh, assessments and decisions, efficacy in trade, um, streamlining import and export uh, permits, and uh, an alignment of regulatory effort and risk. Now those papers and that consultation uh, was quite um, the. the, the the reforms associated with those 
were probably fairly ambitious and fairly large. Um, through that, uh, through that consultation, we had a we had a range of views. Stakeholders, I think, from from what I've heard. Sorry, I, I can't take credit for any of this. I wasn't wasn't involved at this stage. Uh, Mark Kelly was uh, was running the show, as I've said. Um, stakeholders were broadly supportive of most of the measures. A couple couple um, were less so around efficacy and trade assessments and doing away with the need for those. Um, in particular, I understand uh, didn't get uh, as much support. Um, but the, the but the proposals, while they were fairly ambitious, I understand were fairly high level as well. Not a lot of detail underpinning how it, you know how the rubber would hit the road. Um, and so we got quite a few messages messages back that that you know stakeholders people were res, res, reserving judgment on uh, on how these things looked until until sensibly until they understand how they'd affect them and how they'd affect the regulatory system. Um, we did hear um, a lot of concerns, as I as I mentioned earlier, or a lot of not, not necessarily concerns, but a lot of a lot of people highlighted the impact of the ongoing series of sort of significant regulatory reform, and uh, both on APVMA and on um, the the registrants and applicants themselves, how they uh, in you know keeping up keeping up with the constant change. There was an appetite to. Let uh, while while there were some um, some priority areas highlighted, there was an appetite to let the previous changes and the changes from 2014, uh, which had been significant, sort of run their course, bed in and get an understanding for for how they played out before making further significant change. Um, but the but the message we got was there was still still obviously. Lot, lot, lots of areas, lots of work to do. Um, the, the immediate focus that from, uh, from stakeholders that we heard should be on uh, efficiency measures. Um, uh, but there's also some other sort of key priorities, tidies up around the legislation, specific issues uh, that, that various groups or individuals have. Um, so so the, the department um, has sort of taken, taken that on board. And are trying to uh, trying to proceed in a in a bit of a more measured way at this stage, rather than necessarily driving ahead with sort of significant legislative change, um, moving the goalpost, changing the playing field. We've been working a lot more closely with APVMA and are looking at ways to find efficiencies, to progress reforms. Um, that, that don't necessarily need need the big sledgehammer to work with policy and to work to work with policy uh, tools to work with with direction. Uh, Karina's spoken about a lot of uh, a lot of the work that, that they're doing in the in the space, sort of in in alignment with the white paper. Um, I understand there'll be some more discussions around that later in the day. Uh, we'll implement regulatory change if and as needed to support uh, to support reforms, but sort of major major legis legislative change. Is uh, is on an as needs on an as needs basis, but but from from the messages that that might have been taken from those discussion papers last year, probably not as as dramatic as might have been uh, might have been suggested or the impression might have been uh, given. Um, so we're continuing to work with APVMA to um, to help them find uh, or to support. Sorry, we're not we're not helping them find their efficiencies. They're finding their efficiencies. That's not uh, not something we can take credit for, but but to support uh, to provide what support we can where we can, uh, where regulatory change is needed to underpin some of that. We'll be working with the APVMA to uh, to work that through. Um, we are planning after the, after the election. We uh, committed to get a paper. To, to government about what the reforms uh, reform package might look like, still largely covering the same areas. It's our intention that were consulted on previously, but as I've said, uh, without the sort of without the sledgehammer is not probably the the right word, but without the, the radical change with the with the more sort of um, policy uh, type approach uh, change. Um, so that includes a, a package of those measures. Also heard. Um, I think I just stepped into the job at the last uh, one of these, and um, and I, I got a fair bit of feedback. And obviously, the department has also got a fair, fair bit of feedback, and APVMA has shared 
feedback with, uh, with some concerns over annual returns and we've been asked to prioritise that. Uh, this is annual return reporting on, uh, on active constituents. And so we're working to uh, working to come up with a solution, um, or a, you know, a, a possible solution uh, to that, that that meets government's needs, but that doesn't uh, doesn't overly burden uh, industry, um, overly burden registrants. Um, we've also been asked to to work on um, on incentives for for minor use, and that's something we'll be working on. Um, sort of, uh, I've, I've said before that it'll be a next cab off the rank um, issue, but it, it'll be sort of one of our one of our issues on our on our radar. Um, and we'll, after we get the paper paper to government, get government's views. Um, so, so as I say, these these decisions have been made within <coughs> the department. They haven't been endorsed by by government yet. We'll put it put them to government. After we get government's feedback, then we'll go out and work with APVMA and work with stakeholders next year. To, uh, to to refine and, and implement those. Sorry if you can't hear me. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, one of the key uh, priorities that we've heard and uh, something that we understand that, um, that uh, registrants aren't, uh, aren't comfortable with, aren't happy with, is around the annual reporting of, of um, active constituents. Um, this is where, um, where manufacturers, importers, exporters uh, are required to report the quantities of, uh, of active constituents imported, exported, disposed of during the year. Um, this, this isn't a new legislative requirement, but it's just been re-implemented, I suppose, after a, after a period of, um, of hiatus might not be the right word, but, but after the data hadn't been collected for a, for a, for a few years. It is uh, information on on chemical uh, use is probably probably not the right word, but on, on the chemical inventory um, that comes through Australia is uh, is important for government um, for a number of reasons. But we recognise um, concerns um, a about the regulatory burden that the that the current arrangements uh, put on registrants. Uh, also concerns uh, of the of the usefulness of the data. I think the data, as, as I understand it, the data requires a, a fair bit of massaging to be useful. Still, we, we still get our get get what we need out of the current data, but uh, but it's not a straightforward matter. So, as I've said, uh, that's a priority issue we've been looking at. Uh, we've got people within our our AgVet task force, our AgVet area within the department, uh, working on a on a solution um, that that might meet that, that hopefully meet uh, all of our needs. Um, and that might be, might look like, at the moment they're sanding out, what might look like something around reporting products um, and the amounts of, amounts of products, um, import, export, manufacturer, um, and annual reporting aligned with, with levy uh, reporting. It's not, not fully developed yet. We'll, uh, we'll wor work up something, or those people within the, within the department will work up something. We'll come out to stakeholders and see, see how that works. Um, the department's also uh, involved in some control of use um, initiatives. Excuse me. Um, so again, given given the time, I sort of won't go into too much detail. But effectively, the department has been working with uh, with the states and territories and trying to sort of play a. A facilitating role, trying to get them all in the same room and on the same page um, around control of use uh, measures. And I know many of you will be aware. And as Karuna mentioned uh, mentioned earlier, um, unfortunately with the with the timing, but the department's also running some roundtables around control of use uh, issues today um, across the across the lake. I won't go into a great deal of detail. My apologies for all the words on this slide. I, I, Thought if I had a, if I had a bit of time I could uh, I could run you through what what they are but essentially uh, there's a, there's a few working groups under this national um, AgVet Chemicals Task uh, Task Group uh, which is uh, sort of the senior officials of all agencies um, state and territory agencies uh, uh, with um, with the, with the department um, they've they've formed some working groups. There's a, a proposal has been developed and is being um, considered today at the round table across the lake um, around record 
record keeping, uh, consistent requirements across all jurisdictions. Um, there's, a, um, there's probably too many words there for you, for you to get through, but there, there's a proposal, there's a, sh a very short discussion paper. Um, they'll be seeking feedback on that. I suppose if that's something that you weren't aware of and are particularly, particularly interested in, if you, for some reason you didn't, uh, uh, were, you know, weren't uh, on, the, on the list for, for that round table to get, the, to get the information, I suppose the key take home message, if I can get the, there you go, is um, if you send an email to, to that address and, and let them know you're interested in seeing what the, what the proposals are, what the discussion papers are, um, I'm sure they'll be able to able to send you something thereafter. Some some comment this week on some very short discussion paper, hence the roundtable uh, this week. Um, also been some some agreement, as I understand it, around um, general conditions uh, for allowed variation from label uh, label instructions. Um, and uh, to, to me, looking looking at uh, looking at what was in that discussion paper, it looks very much uh, sort of like some of, some of the features of the Victorian model uh, are being looked at being. Um, implemented uh, more broadly. Uh, another, another working group under the ACTG, again, um, part, of this, part of this round table across the lake today, is looking at harmonising <coughs> training and licensing requirements. Uh, that includes um, harmonised uh, training and, uh, and uh, interjurisdictional recognition um, of licensing for commercial spray operators. Um, harmonised training requirements, but not licensing training requirements for, um, for users of Schedule 7 and restricted chemical products, um, as well as harmonising, obviously, if harmon with, with the harmonised licensing comes the harmonised arrangements for training for commercial operators. Um, uh, again, um, if, you're, if you're interested and, uh, and you want to see those, those brief discussion papers, if you flick, uh, flick the AgVet policy Inbox uh, an email. I'm sure they'll. Um, I'm sure they'll sort you out with the paper. Um, the the group is also looking at uh, at developing a proposal. Again, they'll have a discussion today, but it doesn't appear to me to be as uh, as well developed around compounding and prescribing rights um, and har harmonising those. Um, uh, trying to trying to sort of find the, find the balance between between. Um, Compounding and and um, and incentives for you know you know not not destroying incentives for for use of registered products um, and and for off label use um, under veterinary prescription or veterinary direction. Um, improved access to to chemical products, um, as you're probably aware, uh, the government. Uh, Put eight million dollars uh, towards this a couple of a couple of years ago. Eight million dollars over four years, I believe. Uh, there's a number number of things, a uh, number of initiatives underway under that program. Um, around uh, one of which is collaborative forums uh, for plant and animal, which are run by uh, RURDIC, the Rural Industries RDC. Um, uh, trying to identify priorities, bring stakeholders together to sort of get that. Um, um, crit critical mass um, for for looking for registra registration for uses um, or you know, essentially minor uses. Um, APVMA is doing some doing some work on permit to labels and uh, and crop groupings, and there's uh, a grants program that the department's running um, up for grants up to a thousand dollars to um, for for legal use of minor uses. Um, that includes uh, getting permits for minor uses, but but the big part of that is uh, is hoped to be um, getting getting more uses on label. Um, that's uh, dollars. Um, GHS labelling. This has been the bane of my existence since I uh, since I started in this job. Um, so it's the the one bit of agvet chemical policy that I that I understand inside and out because I've, I've lived and breathed it for the last six months. Um, some of you may be aware that there's some regulations uh, that require some additional statements on, um, on AGVET chem labels. Well, that, uh, the, the do it by date is, uh, is six weeks away or seven, eight weeks away. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you, that you don't know there. Uh, requirement for statements based on a 
UN's globally harmonised system for classification labelling chemical chemicals. Need uh, additional label statements uh, about each product's intrinsic hazards and uh, and related statements uh, about the precautions associated with those hazards. Um, uh, apply to all workplace hazardous chemicals, um, including ag and vet chemicals. Um, the department uh, in our regulations was required to do a review of this, of the interaction between the ag vet legislation, the WHS legislation, even though we, we don't own the WHS legislation and have no immediate, um, immediate uh, control over it. But, um, but we've, we've done the, uh, we've done, done a review. We hired um, Deloitte Touche Tomatsu. Um, they've they've uh, led, led the review process for it. The reviews were, uh, reports were put up on the web last week and apologies if we've been a little slow getting that message out. We, uh, we hope to do so, but I think this was a, this was a good uh, opportunity and the, the round table across the lake too will be a good opportunity to get that, that message out. Those reports are available on our, on our web. Um, one of the things that we found challenging, we, the, the, you know, the, the broader we as a port portfolio um, had found challenging was to get messages across to uh, work health and safety regulators um, in states and territories um, about how the AgVet system works and the protections that are built in for, for worker safety and for safety of bystanders and for, for safety of frequent users. Um, and that those those protections provide uh, you know, applied throughout the supply chain. Um, it, it seemed to me that that was a message that had been had been lost. Um, Deloitte's done a, a pretty good job of describing those and also describing the WHS system. Uh, we asked for a, for a balanced report that that showed both sides, um, told both sides of the story. Um, I figured that would be more influential and and more more useful. Um, than, a, than a sort of a, a, a mouthpiece um, to, to spruik our, just, you know, our interests. Um, and it, and it, it confirmed that, that the AgVet system does that. It estimated the cost of labelling to, uh, to industry at around 15 to 15.8 million. That's sort of back of the envelope stuff. It's a fairly different estimate to one that CropLife had, uh, had done. The difference between this work and CropLife's work is that this work doesn't include re the cost of relabeling stock in trade? Um, does it does assume that uh, it does make a couple of other assumptions that all um, all chemicals will need relabeling, which isn't isn't the case as it as it turns out, and I'll speak briefly about that in a moment. Um, but Deloitte Deloitte made the made the point that the extra labelling is unlikely to help people in the agvet chain, given given all the all the systems in uh, in place or ag agvet users. They did, however. Uh, think that there'd be a small benefit to users in the supply chain, to supply chain workers who were used to seeing, who were used to dealing with industrial chemicals and seeing all the GHS warnings on those, and um, and may go to the to the label. Now, which sort of challenged Deloitte on those findings. That that was Deloitte's uh, uh, view, and um, and good on them. Uh, one of the things Deloitte did point out, though, uh, they questioned why vet meds are caught up in the GHS labelling arrangements. Um, we, we, we engaged them to do two, two reports in the end, a, a quick desktop study after the main study of how GHS is applied to ag and vet chemicals um, in some key markets, US, Japan, China, uh, not China, sorry, uh, Japan, New Zealand, Canada. Um, they noted um, uh, between those two reports that GHS wasn't, was never intended to apply to, to veterinary medicines with respect to the labelling, I should say, I should make clear, um, to the labelling of, of product intended for use rather than bulk materials. Um, while GHS applies in all those um, jurisdictions I just mentioned, uh, none of them really apply it to ag or vet chems. Uh, the, the outlier being New Zealand, who take a, who take a fairly pragmatic approach, I might say. Um, they'll ex they, New Zealand accepts products and product labels um, registered in a number of overseas markets, including hazard-based markets uh, like Europe, um, and, and allows GHS uh, labelling. It's not, not required, it's optional, um, and hazard-based assessment as opposed to risk-based assessment um, is also possible under the New Zealand system. 
Um, now, in terms of the review's recommendations, as I mentioned, this was something that was required under regulation. Sorry, guys, I'll, I'll try to speed it up. Um, the, the regulation required, and, as, and as, since we don't have the uh, control of the legislation sensibly, that recommendations be constrained to matters within APVMA's powers. There's not a lot in there that APVMA can do about, about this or this portfolio can do. The review looked at if, if, you know, if APVMA or if the AgVet system didn't do OH and S assessments, would that, would that be a sensible thing to do? Essentially not, because there's that much crossover between various things. It, would, it wouldn't really it'd just make it more complicated. Um, and so we're working with, uh, with Department of Employment, Safe Work Australia, uh, to navigate a way forward. One thing this process has done, and also um, the, our minister's office has been able to influence, is to, is to get, a, get our foot in the door uh, with, with Safe Work Australia and, and get to speak to, uh, to its member organisations. We've been, as an organisation, as I understand, banging our head on that door for a, for a long time. Um, so Safe Work Australia in February uh, this year released some guidance that uh, that if a statement on the AgVet label is is I think the the wording is there is um, similar or substantially the same as a as a, a GHS and APVMA label then the, the GHS statement isn't additional GHS statement isn't required on the label. Um, we went down to well, went up to Sydney I think to somewhere to a, to a meeting. Um, Karina presented, we presented to the Safe Work members, all the, all the, the sort of the, the voting members. Safe Work, just, uh, just for context, is a, is a body made up of, it's a national body made up of state and territory um, agencies, work health and safety agencies, the Commonwealth agency. It also has industry and, and union representatives um, on that and they're, they're sort of legislated and, and, and they're the ones that make decisions. So no individual jurisdiction has control over this. It's a, it's a, collective, it's a collective group. But we were able to get those messages across to, to explain to them what the AgVet system does, what the impact um, um, of, of this will be. Um, I'm aware that SafeWork as a group is now um, working on excluding Schedule 8 vet meds and Schedule 4 vet meds in packages smaller than, I, I think it's five litres or ten kilos, but it could be the other way around, forgive, forgive me. But that's still got, uh, uh, even though the implementation date is seven weeks away, that's still got to run through the, run through the uh, legislative process. Um, and, we're, uh, and, and Safe Work Australia is going to meet again in, at the end of this month to consider next steps, uh, to consider more broadly uh, the case for um, or against um, uh, the application of these statements to Ag and Vet Meds. Um, other than that, um, the department's also involved in, um, in other sort of international issues, uh, endocr endocrine disruptors in Europe uh, uh, getting, a, getting a profile and there's, there's moves to, uh, to potentially um, uh, ban, for want of a better word, uh, products with endo endocrine disrupting properties. There was an issue with, uh, with glyphosate recently in, in Europe which was, which was up for, the re for review. So the department, the department has a post in Brussels and is sort of actively uh, feeding into those processes uh, where, we, where we can. Um, and the other, the other issue that's sort of, sort of live in the area is that of antimicrobial resistance and we're working with health and therapeutic goods uh, administration. What have you? Just to just to try to try to manage that domestically and um, and uh, to manage any international um, ramifications of that. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much.